Welcome to the Film Florida podcast. My name is John Lux, and I'm the executive director of Film Florida. Today, our guest is Brad Fuller. Brad's background in the motion picture business spans 40-plus years in advertising, corporate, and entertainment production. In 1980, Brad and his brother Mike combined forces to bring new directors to Florida's commercial production scene. The result was Florida Film and Tape, Orlando's first serious commercial production, post-production, and photography studio. Brad has won more than 100 local, regional, and national awards in his time working in the industry, and he is also a Film Florida legend. Thanks for joining us on the podcast today, Brad. Well, you are very welcome. Thanks for having me. So let's start at the beginning. Um, Before you opened Florida Film and Tape, what drew you to the industry and how did you get your start? It was kind of a funny story. And I was working, I was going to school at Rollins, uh, making, I think, a buck 85 an hour in my part-time job as as a landscaper. My brother Mike had started uh, at Patterson Studios working at Patterson. So somewhere along the line, Mike had been there probably a year uh, just doing whatever he could to to, to um, make it work at, uh, in, in the business. He fell in love with the business. And he said, well, John's having a casting down here for a Chiquita Banana commercial. I mentioned that, that you'd be pretty perfect for the job. And, and uh, John said, well, bring him down. So I went down and cast for this thing. And I got a, a, a role in this Chiquita, national Chiquita Banana commercial. And my costume was a clown. I was dressed up like a clown. Uh, and uh, I sat around all day long, never got called on the set because they were running behind schedule, and I made $185 for, for that particular day for sitting on my ass, and I said, damn, this is good business. I think I want to be in this business. <laughs> so, uh, so I went into it doing a lot of modeling and a lot of acting. The modeling was easy, but the acting, I determined that if I want to stay in this business, I better learn something else because I was not very good at it. <laughs> and uh so, uh, so I started working for uh, for Patterson Studios uh, as a, uh, you know, just whatever. I think my first real job was uh, driving Anita Bryant's motorhome around on the Florida Citrus uh, uh, Commission TV commercials. Um, but I worked in the art department, and then I kind of used into the grip department and the electric department and the camera department. And uh, the only thing I didn't do at Patterson was doing editing. Uh, and uh, But at any rate, uh, that got me firmly into the business, and um, I shifted schools, um, shifted majors, went to UCF uh, in their film program, which really wasn't much to speak of back then, but uh, at least it was a start, and then I just uh, freelanced a lot with uh, Patterson. I never was on staff. I just was a kind of a permanent freelancer, and uh, between Patterson and my brother Mike and two or three other folks that I did some work for around uh, around the state. I got a pretty firm start in the business that way. So fast forward to 1980, and you're working in the industry, and you decide to open Florida Film and Tape. Why? Well, the the quick answer is I couldn't find anybody to give me a job. (laughs) I I, I sort of had to create my own. But but the uh, the real answer is is I was um, I had uh, by that time I'd worked for two different production entities, um, Cypress Gardens um, Studios. We had a pretty robust film department down there, and, and I, I learned much, much from there. And uh, one of the guys that worked at Patterson and also worked at Cypress Gardens with me, uh, he and I went together with a third guy who was a writer and uh, put together another production company in Winter Haven. So we, I worked at Cypress Gardens, worked at Associated Image Makers. Then we shut Associated Image Makers down pretty much when the, the non-recourse uh, note disappeared for the for the uh, low-budget feature business. And um, I started doing um, production service, uh, most particularly for EUE Screen Gems out of New York, and I was kind of their Florida liaison for production manager and locations. Got an opportunity to work on a couple of feature films, uh, did that, came back from that, and my wife, Sarah Fuller, who we all know, had uh, taken over my production service business in my absence, did a, a hell of a job with it, uh, better than I was doing, and uh, so there wasn't much room for both of us in that, so I took a job in Baltimore at an ad agency, worked there for two years, built my director's reel uh, at the agency, and then determined that... Uh, we could make a go of it with a real production company in Central Florida. The only one existing at the time was 
really Patterson Studios. There was a guy from years ago named Charlie Prout who was no longer in business. And um, in 1979, when we put this thing together, it was just really just Patterson and Patterson. <laughs> and uh, so, so we put together a commercial production company as a commercial production company as opposed to a guy with a camera. And um, and we, we had pretty good success uh, early on, and, and somehow or another we're still here. So in 1969, if I read correctly, you got your pilot's license um, well before you opened Florida Film and Tape. Did you get the license for working in the industry, or was that a separate hobby that ended up being a good coincidence that worked out well? Totally separate. I was I was uh, I was just really starting out in the in the film business. '68 uh, was my first job that one I mentioned down at uh, Patterson and. Um, uh, and I started flying in 68, and I, I really w- was kind of torn between the film business and, and a flying career. So I, I just continued to pursue the flying, and and the film industry was was much more of a better fit for me. I, it's just where I wanted to go. I've managed to to uh, use aviation and relate to aviation with my film production business over the years, but it really wasn't by design. I wish I could say it was, but it wasn't. I just love flying, and I love the film business, and I was able to hang on to both of them. And, and currently, we have a lot of aviation clients, partly because, uh, or largely because of the um, connection that my brother Mike and I both have to aviation. Mike's, uh, I followed Mike in aviation. I followed Mike in the film business, and um so he, he, he was the one that got me started in both of those, but I, I absolutely love them both and still fly. We have uh, two company airplanes and two personal airplanes, and, and we use uh, the company airplanes uh, for for uh, Florida Film and Tape business all the time. So, um, so it, it's worked out pretty well. The, the technology, not just for aerial photography, but for in general, technology has changed a lot certainly over the years that you've been in the business, but talk about the changes in technology and how they've changed over the years in the way that you do your work. Well, the, uh, probably the, the, the most uh, obvious change for me and the kind of work we do at Florida Film and Tape are uh, the GoPro camera and drones. Uh, both of those have, have changed a lot of the way that we approach shoots and a lot of the results that we get in, in those shoots. Um, along with that, that's kind of a, when I say GoPro camera, it's sort of a, a gen, general statement. And along with that technology comes all kinds of cool little things. It's all also part of the drone industry, uh, you know, little handheld uh, uh, stabilization systems uh, that are the, uh, the Ronin and the, the Mofi and the, and the uh, Osmo and things like that, that for those of us who do action work, it would just, just, you know, change the landscape completely. Prior to that, prior to those two things, the biggest uh, the biggest change was uh, from film to digital. Uh, you know, I, I think us old film guys uh, have finally accepted the fact that uh, this uh, digital thing is not just a passing fad, it's here to stay. Um, so um, I, I would say that was a big, big change. Um, and the biggest change, though, the single biggest change that, that made a huge impact on the business for for me and the way we run our business was um, nonlinear editing. Uh, We were one of the holdouts for the original nonlinear editing, which was film editing. And uh, we we still operated a film edit suite uh, well into the 90s, a lot of stuff on film. The biggest, the single biggest problem with, well, not the single biggest, but two of the problems with, with editing in the old style of film were one of them is you never really got to see your finished product until it came back from the lab. Um, it dissolves were squiggly lines on, on scratched up old work print, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, the, and so you really had to understand what the process was uh, to make it work. You couldn't just say, hey, put a dissolve there. You had to know it was going to work and darks versus lights and, you know, which one punches through and whether it's shot on reversal or negative. And these are all technical things that you just had to understand. Uh, um, and then the other the other part of it that made it really easier was Pro Tools. Because before Pro Tools, we used to do our mixes off of full coat, either 16 or 35 millimeter film, and to actually 
understand what the edit was doing. Like say if I was cutting on my Steenbeck flatbed, I had one picture and three audio tracks. Well, typically you would run six or seven audio tracks to make a thing work. So you never ever got to see your picture with all of the audio tracks uh, working. Uh, you just you had to kind of keep an edit log and and uh, work work on two or three tracks at a time and set that aside, make a mix log, set that aside, and work on the music tracks or the narration tracks or whatever it happened to be. And um, first time you ever saw it all together was when you did a mix, and we had to go to Miami to do the mix. Um, so that was a big, big deal. And we could do about, if we were really good and the logs were good, um, then we could do about 10 minutes of mix a day on a typical uh, corporate uh, corporate film. Corporate films wow. back then were a lot longer. A typical corporate film was 18 minutes long. So it'd take two days to do the mix. And when you got down there, it was full of surprises uh, if you weren't paying attention in the edit because, as I say, it's the first time you ever saw the elements all together. So, the the you know, in a kind of a chronological order, the um, uh, Pro Tools and, and the uh, computer sound process was probably the single biggest thing early on in, in my career, and that was in the, uh, I think it was in the, the middle, late 80s uh, when that really came to be. And then nonlinear editing, we were one of the first folks in town to have an Avid, and we had a whopping uh, six, uh, six gigabytes of uh, storage, and uh, two, three gigabyte drives each cost us about $3,000. Uh, so nonlinear in the early days was just an offline system. Then as it improved, 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 then and, uh, we were able to get rid of our uh, our online, one-inch online suite. We were able to get rid of our uh, offline three-quarter-inch suite um, and just work nonlinear all the way through. And then along comes uh, GoPro and this whole digital uh, revolution. So it's a whole different business than it was in it. And I will say that one of the differences – and from some of the things I've said, it kind of accentuates this, and that is that back in the day, if you will, uh, we actually had to know what we were doing. These days, it's not, not not quite so much, and that's not to take anything away from talented people who just have better tools. But but uh, you know, it's like you shoot a shoot a picture on your Canon 5D Mark IV. If you don't like it, you shoot it again. You know, when we were early on before Florida Film and Tape and, and gosh, right up through the first 20 years of Florida Film and Tape, everything we did was on film, um, and uh, including stills. You know, you, you had to know how to read light meter, and, and if you were shooting reversal film, you had to be within a half a stop of correct every time, or really a quarter stop. Um, and uh, so so it was a, those were the days when, we, when uh, photographers and DPs uh, and editors really earn their money. And again, not taking anything away from the, the talented guys that just have better tools, but it's a lot easier to do the job these days than it was back in 1980, 1990. That's right. Technology has has definitely made things easier, um, but, uh, you know, like you said, not always necessarily better uh, because of the way the process works. Uh, things are just different now. Um, well, it took a long time. For the digital, uh, let's just talk about movies for a second, because uh, we do stills and movies. But but uh, it took a long time for the digital movies to come up to mine and many others' expectations uh, comparing to film. And I had an interesting process uh, very recently where I was doing a project for Bass Pro Shops, and... Um, we weren't matching what they had shot before, but we were inspired by what was shot before. And when I say shot before, it was 2005, uh, and it was shot on 35 millimeter film. Uh, and uh, and so now, flash forward, and we're no longer shooting on 35 millimeter film. We're shooting on digital of our choice. Uh, in this particular case, I chose the uh, Panasonic uh, Vericam LT. Could have chosen anything. We had the budget for any of the cameras. That's just one I, I thought was the right job, right one for this particular job. But, but in the process of being inspired by the previous shoot, I, I went back and looked at a lot of the old film, 
Uh, we weren't trying to say, we are trying to cut into it and match shots, but we were just trying to make it feel the same. And uh, boy, that film was gorgeous. It just held up so well. Um, and the, uh, the, uh, the video also was gorgeous. And when we're finished with all of the grading and color correcting and everything else, I'm going to put the two things back side by side and see what the real feel is. You know, very similar set, very similar lighting. Very similar camera style. The only real difference was a, um, a full image 35 digital image uh, uncompressed versus a full a super 35 film image, obviously uncompressed. So I'm going to see what those what those look like. It'll be interesting. I'll get back to you on that one. It'll definitely be interesting to see that. Yeah, you're based out of Central Florida, but you do work all over the state and all over the country. What keeps you in Central Florida for your home base? Well, it's a lifestyle thing as much as anything. Um, uh, I grew up in Winter Haven, uh, uh, and, you know, spending my time on the lakes and in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, uh, we used to spend every opportunity, at, you know, for long weekends or whatever over on uh, the west coast of Florida in Inglewood. Uh, I, I just didn't want to leave that behind. I've, I've seen a lot of beaches and been to a lot of places, but there's none that none that appeal to me more than than that. And living in uh, Orlando or Winter Haven, where I live for for some time, uh, I've got all the beautiful lakes and the water skiing and the water sports and the family stuff. And then you, you just hop in the car and you're a couple hours away from Gulf of Mexico at St. Pete or or down to Inglewood or Venice or Sarasota, those kind of places, or if you prefer the Atlantic and that, that kind of a, a, a beach, then, you know, you're two hours away, an hour away from uh, from Daytona and New Smyrna over here in, in uh, Orlando. So a lot of it was lifestyle. Uh, a lot of it was uh, stress. I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time uh, in Los Angeles in the business uh, and just vowed that I would make my career work somehow without ever having to live in Los Angeles, and I've, I've managed to do that. I think the most time I've spent in Los Angeles on any project is maybe uh, four weeks. So I, I managed to get away with that one. And New York just never appealed to me. Um, I just didn't want the city. I'm not a city boy. I'm a country boy. So a lot of it was, was that lifestyle. The other part of it is cost. You know, you, you, whatever, you know whatever you, you, you're able to keep in your pocket at the end of the day here in Florida, you need to keep about that uh, times 1.5 if you lived in Los Angeles or New York, um, and um, so there's a lot, just a lot less pressure on finances to to do it here, and uh, it's also a lot easier to be a big fish in a small pond than a, uh, a small fish in a big pond. So if I was going to start myself in the business, um, I thought I'd have a better shot at it here in uh, Central Florida than I would in a major production uh, capital like L.A. or New York. How have you seen the industry as a whole change over the last you know, couple of decades that you've been working in terms of how things are done in Florida and how the industry is here in Florida? Well, having been in the business for quite some time, one of the companies I mentioned earlier on was called Associated Image Makers uh, based in, in Winter Haven. We were early on to understand what the benefits were of shooting in Florida, the, the cost uh, and the locations. Um, and that company was put together to do low budget films and made for TV movies. In the process of understanding what the state had to offer as an alternative to production and being in a position to do something about it, we actually hired a woman, her name was uh, Sunny Fader. I can't believe I remember her name from all these years ago. And she was Florida's first film commissioner under Claude Kirk. But she was on on, uh, on my company's payroll. We paid her. Uh, she also served some purpose for Florida Film, uh, not, I'm sorry, Associated Image Makers at the same time, wow. helping develop some, some business and some clients. But her primary purpose was to be an ambassador uh, uh, Claude Kirk's ambassador to the industry for the film for the film business. Um, so I saw back then. I'm saying that was seventy. I'd have to look at my calendars to to see, but I think that was seventy two to seventy six. That Kirk was was um, governor. But uh, at any rate, in that stretch of time, we did a lot to promote the business, uh, understanding. Uh, 
understanding what it what it was going to take to get people to to take Florida seriously. Forty years ago, the industry in general in Florida had little credibility with uh, anyone outside of Florida. It was a wasn't even a secondary market. It was a third or a fourth market, you know, behind uh, other centers like a Dallas or an Atlanta or someplace like that, or uh, Chicago, obviously Chicago. So the industry has legitimized considerably in the last uh, in the last forty years that I've been in the business. Well, a little longer than forty years, but but um, uh, part of that has been. The efforts of uh, Universal Studios, uh, of Disney, back when Disney had a production uh, presence. EA uh, brought a lot of credibility to the digital world. Um, I, I would say that uh, the credibility is probably the, the most important thing. People take us seriously now. It used to be if I was doing a project and I had you know, an agency out of Chicago I was working for or something like that, they said, why, why aren't you in Chicago? Why do you work in Florida? You know, there's, you know, it's, it's really, you must, you must not be any good because you work in Florida, and that I don't, long, I don't get that any longer. It's like, uh, you know, I talked to people. I was just on a shoot recently in Dallas. People in Dallas were, it's like, gosh, I'd like to work in Florida. <laughs> What's it like? You know, so, so uh, the the industry has taken the Florida production scene a whole lot more seriously than it has in the past. There's still a few elements missing in our Florida production scene, but uh, but, but but we're coming along, we're, we're building, we're growing, we're getting there. One of the big differences uh, between then and now is that then there were maybe four production companies in Central Florida, and then there were another half dozen guys that had a camera. Uh, so the industry has most definitely grown uh, it's changed a lot, uh, uh, as I said earlier, that it's easier to do the job now so more people can get into it. Um, I remember one uh, statement I, I love that I heard probably on the Internet. It said, a, uh, my mom bought me a red camera, so, so I'm a DP. And uh, there's, there's some real truth to that. Uh, where this is headed for me is that as this, this grows and there's a lot of young people, much younger uh, having the opportunity to get started, uh, a lot of that because of the great film programs we have at Full Sail, uh, Valencia, and UCF, uh, there's an awful lot of young people out there that are getting a start and getting the opportunity to go their chops a little bit. And, uh, and I think it's pretty damned important for those of us who came along before to Except the fact that there's a you know a newer generation, or actually it's probably two generations back, but a newer generation of people uh, that are carrying on this business, and rather than resent them coming in and stomping on our toes and taking business away from us, uh, we should we should all embrace that and uh, know that that's the future of the business here in, in the state, and do whatever we can to keep these uh, these folks uh, coming. They're not all young people; some of them are people who've changed careers, but. I'll, I'll classify them all as youngsters as to keep these youngsters uh, uh, moving forward and, and share some of what we, we know uh, and what we've learned over the years. Very wise words, I agree. So I mentioned in the intro that you are a Film Florida legend, both literally and figuratively, of course. Uh, in 2006, Film Florida created the Legends Awards, which is to honor the men and women who played such a big part in establishing our state as an entertainment production powerhouse. You were honored with that award. Uh, talk about what that means to you. Well, it, I, I think it. I think it's a precursor to my obituary. I think they only give this award to old people, but I'm, but I'm, uh, you know, so I, it scares me a little bit. But no, it's and, and seriously, it was. It was really. It was a great honor to get that. I, I do feel like uh, over the years, uh, my brother and I uh, have both contributed a lot to the industry. Um, uh, I, I will say that, um, you know, one of the things I feel pretty strongly about is that after 38 years of almost 40 years now, uh, almost 39 years of Florida Film and Tape, and I don't think we have a single enemy. I don't think there's anybody that 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 has uh, that has a, a bone to pick with us. Um, we approach the industry on a on a straightforward. This is who we are. This is what we do. Uh, basis, 
uh, were extremely fair with everybody and, uh, uh, and, and followed through on what we said. And I think a lot of that is what gave myself and my brother Mike, who's a co-recipient of the award, um, uh, gave us the, the respect of, of, of the industry to, to honor us with that award. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, I think we have done a lot for the business. We, we probably haven't put that much money into the economy because we're kind of a small potatoes outfit. But, uh, uh, but I, I think a lot of people have passed through here have learned the industry from us. I, you know, without naming names, I, I can think of a, a dozen people who started their careers at Florida Film and Tape and have gone on to to much bigger and better things. And I'm proud of that. I think that's about it. Just just uh, uh, just the respect that we've garnered by doing doing business straight up uh, and not not having to do business through lawyers. We just do it on a handshake and get it done. Well, as somebody that uh, has lived in Florida for about 20 years now and has worked in the industry and, uh, you know, continues to work in the industry, I just want to say thank you for everything that you've done uh, to to get our industry to this point. And hopefully we can continue what you've done in the past and and continue to make you proud as, as the industry continues to evolve through the next, you know, another four decades. Well, thanks, John. And we're all, uh, I'm all in here, you know. We're this, the company's going to continue. I'm, I'm uh, frankly slowing down a little bit and picking and choosing my projects, uh, as is brother Mike. Um, but we've got uh, we've got a great group of people behind us, uh, young and younger, <laughs> or younger and young, and uh, we're going to we're going to keep on trucking. We're we're uh, I think uh, I think the term that I like to use is I'm probably going to die in harness. I don't think I'm ever going to actually quit doing what I do. Um, to say I may pick and choose a little bit, but uh, or maybe shift gears and do do some projects that I've wanted to do for many years in the documentary world and the feature world. But uh, I'm, we're still here to be a big part of the Florida scene and do whatever we can to continue promoting the Florida scene. Good, good. Um, to wrap things up, you know, in your years of working in the industry, do you have any you know a favorite project or a, a most memorable event that's happened? Well, I would say there were there were two events that that kind of shaped a lot of what I did. And actually, I'm I'm going to make that three events, and I do it in chronological order. The first event was when we were starting Florida Film and Tape. We were maybe a year old. Uh, I went to um, Channel Six and pitched uh, doing their promos to a guy that I'd never met named Jack Tinsley, and uh, Jack was the uh, promotion manager, promotion director, whatever the title was, at Channel 6 at the time. And uh, he he liked what he saw in us, and he gave us our first really big break, a, a series of, they weren't that expensive, but they looked expensive, 35-millimeter film commercials that we shot for Channel 6, and they were something completely different than had ever been done in this market for anybody at the time. Um, and... Uh, and all of a sudden, that made the local market and the television market uh, anywhere in the country take notice of us. And so, for gosh, probably four years, a, a good chunk of our commercial work was uh, promotions for TV stations all around. I won't say all around the country because I don't think we ever went out west with it. But east of the Mississippi, we did a ton of TV promotion work. Uh, and, uh, and then Jack... Uh, we got along so well with Jack that Jack came on board as my executive producer and worked with us for about four years in that process and still remains a really good friend, uh, uh, a friendly competitor, but a super good friend. And uh, so that was number one. Number two was um, a little music video from a guy that not everybody had heard of at the time named Alan Jackson. And um, I got hired to shoot a little video called Chattahoochee, uh, which is a based on kind of water skiing and you know family time around the water and stuff like that. And uh, and that particular video it was the first one I first music video I ever did. Went on to win the CMA award uh, for for best country music video, and, um, and that opened up a lot of doors for me, uh, not only in the country music video business, but also just kind of a credibility all the way around because almost 
anybody that I talked to, even if they weren't country music fans, knew about that video because it was a game changer for the country music business. And it wasn't so much for what I did that it was a game changer. It was the concept and how it ended up. But it was sort of like a, these days, a, you know, a viral video on YouTube. It just caught on, and all of a sudden, the country music was no longer talking about trains and moms and drunks and dead dogs. It was talking about fun and, you know, stuff like that. And it, was, it changed country music quite a bit and uh, opened up. I would say that video probably opened up doors for a lot of folks. Like I won't name any names because I'm not an expert in the country business, but uh, but that was event number two. Event number three was um, a project I did for a uh, aviation museum in uh, Denver, Colorado. The principal of that, the the on camera host of that movie, was Harrison Ford. So it started out as a much smaller project, um, you know, just or it's kind of point of reference, it started as a $125,000 project with Harrison Ford shot in the mountains in Idaho and, uh, and uh, Wyoming. Ended up about a $450,000 project. Still shot in Wyoming, still shot in, in, in Idaho, but uh, it, the production just grew and grew and grew, and, they, and the uh, board of directors of Wings Over the Rockies is the name of it brought in some pretty heavy hitter production company uh, people from Los Angeles that that he didn't do it the way that I was going to do it, but what I was able to maintain was my director of photography position, and and uh, and and uh, and brought a lot to the quality of that project uh, and the style of that project that I think has has garnered me a lot of um, respect from people in the aviation industry. Now I, I I can show that movie to any of my aviation clients, of which I have about a dozen or my prospective aviation clients and say, yeah, I did that project. And they say, oh, okay, well, now let's talk. <laughs> so so I would say um, I would say that Channel 6 uh, package that we did with Jack Tinsley, uh, the uh, Chattahoochee video with Alan Jackson, uh, and the Wings Over the Rockies uh, project with Harrison Ford were probably the biggest events and game changers of my 45-year career. So that'll do it for this episode of the Film Florida Podcast. Thanks to Brad Fuller for joining us today and sharing the history and the stories that he has through his career. To learn more about Brad and Florida Film and Tape, visit ffnt.com. That's ffnt.com. And, of course, for more information about Film Florida, you can go to filmflorida.org. And make sure you like our pages on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. 